So you made it to Mexico City. Ah. And then what? Well, first off, uh, the uh, ambulance trip through Mexico City to the British American Hospital nearly did it to me again. <laughs> it, was, it was that, I don't know what you know about Mexico City, but at that time even, 20 million people live in that city. It's the biggest in North America. It's bigger in New York City or Los Angeles. And uh, the traffic is what you would think. Anyway, when we got out of the ambulance at the British American Hospital in Mexico City, my then wife was in absolute tears because it was such a terrifying ride through the streets. I didn't see any of it, so I didn't care. Anyway, they uh, hauled me in and they, uh, their chief surgeon came to visit me and uh, his uh, nickname was Il Gato, which means the cat. And I said to one of the nurses, why do they call him the cat? And she said, did you see his eyes? He had cat's eyes. So he came along, they had splinted me and this, that, and the other thing, and stitched my lip, mm -hmm. which was important mm -hmm. to them. And uh, he said, in effect, with a Spanish accent, uh, uh, good news and bad news, uh-huh. And uh, the bad news is you have a lot of fractures. And the good news is they're really big fractures. <laughs> that didn't sound like good news to me, but it was, evidently. Um, they mostly were, like the leg from the ankle on up, the ankle was dislocated, which is another adventure. And as I said, the four ribs and the blah, 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 this, that, and the other thing. Plus every toe on my left foot. Those were the small fractures. The big ones were everything else. So uh, preparations were made for uh, operation. And as it happened, the anesthetist was married to a lady from Saskatchewan. And so there was a kind of a, a touch there. And the anesthetist is a very important person in a nine-hour operation because essentially he has to keep you near death for nine hours mm -hmm. without losing you. And this gentleman did it. So they slung me together as best they could and put me into a hospital room. And my then wife had to spend 10 days, I think it was, I was in hospital there living in this small room, uh, sleeping on a cot, wearing my underwear, and uh, they said finally that I had lost so much blood that they couldn't let me out of the hospital. I had two units of blood left and the normal is 14. And they wouldn't let me out of the hospital with under four units of blood. And I had not a rare type of blood, but unusual. And to this day, I don't know what it is, to be honest, I never paid much attention. So they said, we haven't got that much blood on hand in the hospital. Perhaps your wife could go out on the street and ask people. <laughs> well, she didn't speak Spanish to begin with. And I don't know, but if you want to go outside the Health Sciences Center here in Winnipeg and ask people, hey, you want to donate some blood to my husband? He's up in there. I don't know how many people would say sure, <laughs> especially if they didn't speak English. Well, how did you get blood? Another part of the story. Uh, Fat Freddie Glazeman was going to smuggle some under his coat. Oh, I, might, I should point out that there is uh, some sort of illegality about transporting blood across a border into Mexico. So you couldn't get the blood in North America and bring it into Mexico. So I had friends in high places, and one of them was the president of a beer company who had influence with the federal government at the time. The liberals were in charge in that year, 84, and he called a friend of his who was known as The Fixer. <laughs> and he explained the situation that he had this friend who had been in a bad accident in Mexico and was uh, short of blood and they didn't have any and what could be done. And The Fixer said, give me a while, and within a short time said, it's looked after. It's fixed. And my friend said, well, who do we have to thank? Long pause. Vote for Pierre Trudeau. Pierre Trudeau saved your life. Evidently. What he did was arrange for uh, two representatives to go to the Canadian consulate in Mexico City, donate blood at the British American Hospital, and then go back home. And with that, I was given, I had enough blood 
to fly back home to Edmonton. Next problem, he can't move. I could wriggle my fingers and roll my head and that was it. So I couldn't sit up or be stood up or stood up or anything. So how do we get him home? Well, one thought was let's rent the top of a 747, the bubble, mm -hmm. and we'll stretch him out in that and fly him home that way. Well, that was thought about for a while, and it didn't work. So, again, friends in high places in Edmonton found a private jet. They found a doctor, Tom Gordanis, God love him, and a nurse to uh, come down and accompany me uh, on the trip back to uh, Edmonton from Mexico City. Unfortunately, the good doctor developed the case of the Mexican two-step, so he had a very difficult ride home, <laughs> worse than me. I was just lying there looking at the roof of a, of a jet plane. <laughs> as, we're, as we're getting close to uh, Edmonton, the pilot uh, gets back to us and says, the TV stations in Edmonton are interested in this story, and they wondered would it be all right to photograph you when they get you off the plane. And I said, in effect, who cares? <laughs> what, they, you know, what do I care? But my then wife, beautiful lady, uh, got herself prepared. We landed in Edmonton. The photographers and the uh, TV stations were there. They took a picture of me coming off, dressed like a mummy with all this uh, bandaging and everything. Uh, but the uh, papers reported she looked terrific. <laughs> <laughs> what she did, what she did. We'll hold you there. Okay. Thanks.